Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining this webinar on optimizing clinical trial design with extracted efficacy data. My name is Marnix Fiefer, and I'm Senior of Solution Marketing Manager Drug Safety at Elsevier. I'm joined today by Jean-Dominique Pierre, who is a Customer Consultant Drug Safety at Elsevier, and we'll do this uh, webinar together. We'll all take our take part of mostly uh, uh, slides and introduction, and Jean-Dominique will take us through a couple of Pharmapendium workflows. Now, uh, before diving in, a couple of housekeeping rules, uh, rules I should say, uh, comments. Uh, first, we would like to recommend to watch the presentation in full screen mode. And um, if you have any questions during the webinar, um, you can always type these questions into the ask a question box underneath the webinar screen. Um, um, we try to address all the questions towards the end of the webinar. Um, in case if we run into any time limitations, we will address any unanswered questions by email. As you're registered through Bright Talk, we should be able to get back to you by email. Now last, um, if you uh, find uh, the solutions that we present today very interesting and you would like us to follow up with you, towards the end of the webinar, we will pull up a uh, a poll uh, where you can then vote yes uh, if you would like us to follow up with you, but we'll present this poll towards the end of the webinar and then you can uh, simply indicate that you would like us to follow up with you. Uh, and if not, then of course you don't need to vote uh, and um, uh, no responses will be correct. Now for today's agenda, um, what we would like to discuss with you today is first provide some background into issues with clinical trial and endpoint selection. Uh, then um, we're going to discuss a bit around finding efficacy information into pharmapendium uh, and how this will help you to make those formed uh, clinical uh, development decisions uh, in pharmaceutical development. Then Jean-Dominique will take us through a couple of workflow examples. Um, first, around searching for endpoints by full text searching in uh, FDA uh, advisory committee do documents. And uh, then an example around optimizing clinical trial design through uh, insights from extracted efficacy data. And then there's time for uh, a Q&A after a couple of uh, roundup uh, um, uh, comments. Um, and hopefully at the end of this uh, uh, meeting, you have collect some new insights into clinical trial design and endpoint selection, and uh, uh, have some uh, insights into how Pharmapendium can help to optimize clinical research. And for those on the call already using Pharmapendium, you hopefully get some practical insights into finding efficacy data in Pharmapendium. Um, let's dive in. So as most of you are no doubt aware, um, uh, clinical research is divided over multiple phases, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. And from phase one to phase three, uh, clinical research gets more and more uh, expensive. And not surprisingly, the bulk of the costs of, of clinical development sit in phase uh, three uh, research. Here's an example where the estimate cost of a uh, phase 3A uh, trial is around 30 uh, million US dollars. And of course, there's many of these numbers around, but they all point to the uh, high cost of phase three. So phase three trials mostly associated with the high number of patients being enrolled in those trials. Not surprisingly, we really would like to avoid uh, late stage clinical failure due to the associated uh, cost. So what uh, are now common causes for late stage clinical failure? And research shows that efficacy is really the main cause of late stage failure in clinical trial. Around 50% of all the late stage clinical trials that fail, fail due to efficacy reasons. So just uh, uh, for those uh, not familiar with the concept, efficacy is the capacity, let's say, for beneficial change uh, or therapeutic effect of a given drug or medical intervention. Now, uh, if we look at the consequences of, of, of late stage failure, as, as we mentioned, there's of course significant cost uh, associated with that. And here we we'll just look at a couple of examples of, 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 late, of the consequences of, of late stage 
failure. For example, uh, we just highlighted a couple here in red where um, in the case of the failure of uh, Kabut, uh, Kabut Tilip, uh, 150 jobs were lost. Uh, there was a lot of termination cost, uh, a lot of uh, stock-based uh, issues as well. In the case of uh, Tabalu Map, uh, the total development need to be held. Uh, there were 63 million uh, in termination cost uh, in 2014. And as you can see from this list, there are significant costs uh, associated uh, with late stage failures. But this, of course, uh, this doesn't even take into account the already sunk cost when developing drug or lost market revenue due to clinical trial failure. And this also doesn't really take into account, let's say, the, um, the loss of benefit for patients that could benefit from um, um, uh, that could benefit from these new treatments. Um, so let's, let's zoom into more detail why these trials actually fail and pull up the next slide. And what we can see is that uh, there's a couple of reasons for, for late stage failure. And I highlighted a couple here uh, with number code. So a, a very common reason for late stage failure is basically has to do with the populations uh, that were selected. This is a study where uh, the 302 new molecular entity applications were analyzed. And what they saw is that uh, 151 basically passed uh, in the first, uh, through the, the review process, and 151 had what they call first cycle review failure, and then analyzed what was the, fail what was the reason for this first cycle failure. And what we can see that the significant part of those had to do with population, but the population either did not appropriately reflect the intended use or the size of the population was too small to demonstrate efficacy. Another common cause for, for first uh, cycle review failure was endpoints being unsatisfactory, and we'll get back to that in a bit, but basically that means that not the appropriate endpoints were selected or evaluated in that clinical trial. And what we can see if we look at the, the right-hand column, drugs never approved during studies. Out of the 151 that went into first cycle review failure, uh, that were failed during the first review cycle, 80 of those uh, never got approved. And of those 80, uh, 15 uh, were, uh, basically did not, ha basically had unsatisfactory factory endpoints, suggesting that these endpoints are a very common cause, or let's say unsatisfactory endpoints, have a common cause for clinical trial failure. Now, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page here, what are now these endpoints? Um, and I took this definition out of the uh, FDA uh, training uh, slide deck. Um, uh, by, the, by the way, at the end of the meeting, you can also download this slide deck so you can have access to all the links as well. You know, so the only reason that a patient would want to take a drug uh, if the drug is uh, basically will improve survival or it results in a benefit that was detectable by the patient, it could be improvement in symptoms, improvement in the function of capacity, or if the drug uh, decreases the chance of developing condition or disease. And therefore, a primary endpoint should be a direct measure of one of these of the above mentioned. And there is an exception which are called surrogate endpoints, which I'll get back to in a bit. Now, um, these endpoints, um, it is really a, a part of the study design. So these endpoints, before you do a clinical trial, these endpoints need to be determined and are really part of that study design and need to be, need to be submitted before you actually move into a, into a clinical trial. And then the clinical trial will be tested to meet that specific primary endpoint. So that's why it's really important to pick the right endpoint from the start, because if you basically start your trial with the wrong endpoint, um, the trial might actually fail because uh, you can't really compare it with the drugs that are currently out there. It may be tested at a different endpoint. So really getting answers to these kind of critical questions for trial design analysis. So there's a couple of more questions we can ask. Yeah? So uh, what is the efficacy benchmark we need to beat? What's the right patient population size to show statistical significance? What is the right patient population? Uh, what patients should we include or exclude? And there is an interesting number associated with this. As you can imagine, if you take too many patients in your uh, trial, 
including patients in clinical trial is really expensive. There's a couple of numbers circulating, but this particular manuscript mentions 42,000 per patient. And you can imagine that including, let's say, uh, 100 uh, patients too many, more than you actually need, uh, is, is, of course, a significant cost driver. On the other hand, if you include too little patients in your trial, you might uh, endanger the, the statistics of your trial and might not have enough patients to actually uh, be statistically, for your effect to be statistically significant. Next, of course, you might ask, what's the appropriate trial design? How should we analyze our trial data? And maybe can I repurpose my drug based on primary endpoints as well? Now, with all these questions, um, um, the regulatory documents are really a key resource uh, to find answers to all those questions. So when um, uh, drug developers uh, basically submit their drug, you know, they do this as, a, in, as part of a regulatory approval package, and it contains all the aggregated data that will be evaluated by the regulatory authorities. And um, once they, uh, the regulatory authorities approve of that application, right, um, that means that data in that document are kind of the highest quality data that you can get as they have been evaluated and approved of by the regulatory authorities. So that really creates a very high quality data set which serves as a benchmark for new drugs that would like to go to the market um, to be compared against. Because if a new drug goes to market, that is the current benchmark that needs to be uh, uh, compared against to, uh, to get new drugs to the market. Now, uh, as you are no doubt aware, regulatory documents uh, and the, the efficacy data in those regulatory documents is quite hard to get by. So um, although, for example, FDA approval packages uh, or summary basis of approval packages from 1992 and onward are offered on the FDA website, um, these documents can often only be recovered uh, by individual downloads of the various sections of the approval packages. Uh, many of these approval packages are only available as scans of microfiche files, so really not allowing any full text uh, searching. Uh, documents uh, can often only be retrieved based on drug name of the approval package um, or and cannot be identified based on drug class, target, or indication. And of also pre-1992 approval packages are not available on the website and only available uh, upon, let's say, document request. So overall, this is a very important source of regulatory information and efficacy data, um, but it's really extremely hard to access and extremely hard to find the data most relevant for you. So basically what we do is uh, at Pharmapendium, basically we take all uh, the FDA approval drug documents dating back to 1938, we take EMA drug approval documents dating back to 1995, we take FDA FAIRS data, we take FDA advisory committee remitting reports, and we'll get back to that in a bit as well, and we take journal articles. Then we take uh, those documents, and in the case of the FDA documents and these uh, scanned microfiche files, and make those documents text searchable. And on top of that, we define a taxonomy and develop a database structure. And a, 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 a panel of experts, a PhD, MD level uh, readers, will go through these documents and extract observations on safety, pharmacokinetics, metabolizing enzymes and transporters, and specifically for today, which is relevant, is efficacy data. And then uh, take that data and build a, uh, a index database out of that, where all the data is linked back to the original source document, and all the extracted data is searchable across drug class uh, um, and chemical structure, and data can very easily be exported. So what does this mean? And after this, we dive into the live example. We take uh, important but highly unstructured, poorly searchable data and turn this into high quality regulatory data that can be easily retrieved from the entire approval package. Now let's take a look together, and Jean-Louis will take us through what this now means in practice uh, when it specifically comes to clinical research data. Can you take over from here, Jean-Louis? Hello, yes, thank you, Matt. Yeah. It's, um, hello, everybody. Pleased to be, to be with you, speaking with you today. 
so you might want to yeah there you go there you go um, for the demo today, I will use um, the example of uh, HIV infection, um, especially what are the endpoints uh, used in the clinical development of uh, antiretrovirals. Uh, My first example is uh, what information is available on surrogate endpoints related to HIV. Um, as kind reminder, I like to 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 make short clarifications about uh, endpoint and surrogate endpoint. Uh, a clinical trial uh, endpoints uh, measure the outcomes of uh, the clinical trial itself. They directly measure whether uh, the patient people in a, in the trial feel or function better or live longer. Uh, surrogate endpoints. Um, may be used instead of clinical outcomes uh, in some clinical trials. Uh, surrogate endpoints are used when the uh, clinical outcomes, uh, like uh, in HIV infection, might take a very long time to, to study, or in case where uh, the clinical benefit of improving, of improving the, the surrogate endpoint, uh, such as the number of copies of uh, HIV RNA, the viral load, uh, is well understood. Um, for example, it can be systolic blood pressure uh, for stroke, uh, LDL cholesterol for heart attack, or forced expiratory volume for asthma. Surrogate endpoint is more likely to be useful when the physiopathology of the disease and the mechanism of action of the drug are well understood. Uh, to be accepted in a place of a clinical outcome, a surrogate endpoint, of course, must be validated. Uh, let's go into Pharmapendium. This is the Pharmapendium user interface. And if uh, you have access to Pharmapendium in your company, it can look uh, a little bit different according to the modules uh, your company subscribes to. Today, I will focus on the efficacy module. However, to begin with, uh, let's start uh, looking uh, for a validated uh, surrogate endpoints for HIV infection in, in Pharmapendium by doing a, a, a text search. We can do there a quick text search, uh, but it doesn't allow to enter enough parameters. That's why um, I, I'm going to do an advanced uh, text search. Here, uh, I'm searching uh, into uh, FDA, uh, uh, I'm searching for validated on surrogate, both words uh, within five words or less, and HIV in the same documents, including synonym. And I'm able to search in all those sources. Uh, FDA approval package, EMA approval documents, uh, FDA advisory documents, DESI documents, Miller's and Mosby, that are two textbooks. Uh, let's go. I will focus on, uh, let's go to look what happened there. This is uh, how the full text uh, search looks. Uh, like the results. Uh, it's different from the extracted information that I will show you later, and Marnix gave you a flavor before. Um, in, in approval package here, for instance, I can drill down and apply filters, and I will uh, uh, go uh, to select some FDA approval package. I can uh, select clinical on, on uh, clinical pharmacology and biopharmaceutics uh, review. This is the result, how look, the result looks like. You have got uh, all the documents there, all the information, and uh, the uh, information I'm looking for, validated on surrogate, on HIV, are highlighted here. Uh, I will open the first document. 
the tool opens the document uh, right to the page where we search for. And uh, here on the left pane, you can see uh, all the approval uh, package uh, for this drug, for Tenofovia. Um, the approval package is uh, organized by type of documents and then within each type by date. I can search within the document uh, itself or I can search also here within the full approval package. And for instance, we can find this interesting uh, sentence within this approval package about uh, HIV RNA. That is, the number of copy of HIV RNA is a validated surrogate endpoint for viral load thus efficacy. Uh, this is, that is the kind of information that I, I, I'm looking for. And this information is valuable because uh, I can quickly find that the viral load is a validated endpoint and it's used in clinical uh, uh, study design. Uh, actually, I would like to touch on uh, another data source that is also uh, very uh, valuable uh, that are uh, the FDA advisory committee. Here. And with Pharmapendium, you can also do a text search. Advisory committees uh, provide FDA with uh, independent advices uh, from outside experts on uh, issues related to drugs. Yet uh, the FDA makes the final decision. For instance, when a FDA a reviewers complete the initial review of a product application and they may identify questions where uh, external input is needed. So the reviewers will ask a group of uh, experts uh, for input to help them to make a, a product approval decision. The, the FDA's approval decision is broadly consistent with the recommendations of the advisory committees. That is the value on why the advisory committee's uh, documents are so important. And I propose to, to investigate uh, those documents for validated surrogate endpoints. And I, I will uh, use exactly the same uh, uh, request. I will stay there and just focus on uh, antiviral uh, advisory committee. Just to limit my set to this kind of uh, documents. If there are any response and yet, We've got nine records uh, on this set of documents that are relevant. Let's go for this one. This is a transcript, a pretty old one, and a viral load uh, in HIV was discussed at that time, around that time. And this is as a transcription of uh, an advisory committee about HIV RNA as an endpoint uh, for uh, 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 as a surrogate endpoint for, for HIV infection and for viral load. And let's search within the document for validation. Here. It is a part of the discourse of Dr. Matthews. And Dr. Matthews is a, is a committee member. And what he is saying about viral load is uh, he thinks that uh, viral load RNA uh, copy number is a very important uh, uh, marker about uh, the infection and 
uh, he's discussing there the surrogacy of this marker. And I will highlight, he thinks it's an important marker. And next paragraph here, so my conclusion is RNA viral load can be included as a major component of your new primary endpoint for clinical trial of antiretrovirals, okay? And also discussing another one, CD4 plus cells. Can check for something else. Validated. I'm screening the document, browsing it, reading it. And then here I've got another thing very interesting. Validated is here. And it's a kind of sensitivity of the test. And the range of uh, HIV RNA copies per milliliter, uh, what is expected. Uh, in terms of sensitivity for uh, the viral loads assay. So, we will find here an interesting expert discussion uh, on these topics, uh, considering each HIV uh, RNA viral load um, as an endpoint and pushing the FDA, uh, encouraging the FDA to, to, to validate it. And pharmacopoeia is the only solution that allows you to directly search the full text of advisory committee's document and to quickly find those really valuable uh, information. Marnix? Unmute, can you hear me, jean -Omnic? Yes. Perfect, okay, I was in mute. So, uh... Thanks for that. I think uh, Sean and Nick very nicely uh, showed how with a few clicks, we can really uncover those uh, critical efficacy insights uh, by searching really uh, through the full text, uh, the document base of pharma pending for kind of efficacy data. And in, we recovered some really important comments um, from these documents uh, that are really normally not text searchable and uh, helping us to select the right endpoint in this case for uh, for antiviral drugs so thanks for that uh, jean um so basically we just discussed how in pharma pending we take really that extensive set of regulatory documents and make them text searchable and in this example shown how we can search through this full document base uh, in full text um however we also read those documents ourselves and actually extract data and parameters around efficacy from those documents, which includes information around indications, um, the endpoints, uh, study designs, treatments, demographics, and species as well. And as you in the second example, we'll show you what this like, looks like uh, in practice. Um, and through this extracted data, we really try to deliver you with the data and the answers on how to set up your clinical trial uh, or, or give you good guidance in how to set up your clinical trial without the need to dig into regulatory documents manually um, um, and, and find the data by hand. So uh, just before we dive into the, uh, to the, to the next example, jean of already briefly mentioned this. There is, a, there is multiple types of endpoints, and both types are extracted in pharma pendium. There is what we call direct or, 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 or true or slash clinical meaningful endpoints. And basically, that refers to uh, endpoints that, that refer directly to how a patient feels, functions, or survives. And these endpoints uh, can be both objective or subjective. And as uh, jean dominique already mentioned, there is a kind of surrogate endpoint as well, and we looked at an example of that already, which basically is, is a laboratory measurement uh, or a physical sign that is intended to be used as a substitute for a clinically meaningful endpoint. Sometimes there are no good um, direct, or direct clinical endpoints, and we need to work with a substitute. And there it's important that that 
um, that endpoint is validated. So it must be experimentally determined that this endpoint reflects changes in clinical meaningful endpoints. And on the right hand side, we have a couple of, uh, of examples. Uh, we'll just uh, point the first one out where, for example, systolic blood pressure is a, a validated surrogate endpoint and the correlated clinical outcome would be occurrence of stroke, which then refers to the um, kind of direct measure of how a patient feels, functions, or survives. Now within pharmapendium, I think that's really, um, we use many different taxonomies. Uh, we have a lot of biomedical experts that in-house developed taxonomies for pharmapendium. And the one I would like to specifically focus on today is our pharmapendium endpoint taxonomy. Um, basically, and this taxonomy was developed uh, together with, uh, with pharma partners. So we really listen to our customers to understand what they need and what they would like to get out of such a endpoint uh, taxonomy. And basically, on the right-hand side, uh, and we'll look at this in a, in a, in a live run through in a bit later, is kind of what we call endpoint tested. This is basically how it was exactly mentioned in the approval document, for example, number of patients at risk of discontinuation. Then uh, often these descriptions are quite heterogeneous. So what we try to do, we try to, to match this to an endpoint subtype. So we aggregate these endpoints uh, under an endpoint subtype, and these endpoint subtypes then uh, merge into endpoint types. And through this kind of a branching setup, you can de determine for yourself at what level and what depth within the endpoint taxonomy you would like to search and decide for yourself what granularity you would like to have. And importantly, uh, uh, as we can see in endpoint test, that we always extract uh, also the exact mentioning of how the endpoint is described in a document as well. So you really have that uh, level of detail most relevant uh, for you. Um, now with that, let's take a look how this looks like in practice, and I'll hand it back to Jean Dominique. Thanks again, Marlies. So, we can search here uh, in the extracted data themselves. Uh, there are the different parameters you can use to conduct a search. Uh, for efficacy data within Pharmapendium. This is a typical uh, interface uh, of Pharmapendium when you can search for a uh, uh, different uh, feature. Uh, all are based on, uh, again, as Manif already said, our unique taxonomy that make the information discoverable. Uh, you can search for drugs by drug name. Just have a look. You will have here all the drug classes with all the drug be behind that, by target of the drug or indication of the drug. You can search also by indication, spaces, by sources. Here in the uh, efficacy module, we are looking into the approval packages and EMA approval documents that are extracted from uh, those sources. Uh, and, of course, by endpoints. This is the higher level of the taxonomy. We can go and have a look to the endpoint uh, uh, themselves. This is, there are all the extracted uh, endpoints uh, from the approval packages for HIV arena level. They are here. A lot of. There are different levels into the taxonomy, three levels, and we will also uh, see them uh, into the extracted data. You have got the endpoint themselves. Uh, they are extracted. Uh, directly uh, from the, the source documents, and then they are indexed with the taxonomy. Uh, it can be somehow tedious to go through all the endpoints. That's why here I will close all of the levels, and uh, we start to browse the taxonomy at the top relevant level uh, for viral load. Believe it's the virologic response, and. 
everything I'm looking for, most of them are here. Again, our customers would like to have uh, the endpoints I, as they are mentioned in the original doc document and mapped to the taxonomy higher level to make the search easier. I will search for both. RNA, HIV RNA response, HIV RNA value. And then search. You see um, how quickly I can access to more than 46,000 endpoints uh, related to viral load. Um, again, all those data are extracted from approval documents. Uh, here I will come across all the different parameters that we extract to give you a, an idea of what uh, uh, is uh, available there. Um, uh, we have got something like, we have got 30 parameters, different parameters. They are here. You've got everything here, including the chemical structure of the drug. And uh, some of those parameters are really, really important uh, considering a clinical study. Of course, the study design, double blind, uh, and so on. Uh, the species, because we also extract data, if available, uh, efficacy data from a preclinical study. So you have got all uh, the parameters regarding to the patient themselves, the indication, you have got every very important parameters here regarding to the dose regimen, the drug itself, how it administered. A very important one is the number of patients into uh, this arm of the study. The endpoints also, and the value, the results here. That is real life. Let me hide this pane. And you can see all parameters here, okay? For instance, we've got here the parameters related to uh, the drug and its administration. Uh, you've got here the number of patients and You've got a very important information is endpoint primary, secondary, is it mentioned? Uh, what is endpoint type? That is the taxonomy here. The so original endpoint as extracted from the, or, uh, from the document and the taxonomy is here to retrieve the endpoint. The value, the p-value, and who is the data provider and where the data comes from. Uh, here, I can access to the original document. I will show uh, you that uh, a little bit later. Uh, th there's a couple of things I, I want to show you before. Here, on the left pane, uh, there are all the available filters uh, for the efficacy module that allows you to deeply refine your search. Uh, for instance, uh, you can choose who is the data provider again. That is uh, very important to know who reviews the data, where are the data from. Rarely from literature, sorry, rarely from literature. Uh, in the approval package, sometimes there are some reference to uh, published uh, uh, data in the literature. From reviewer, FDA uh, point of view, the sponsor, and so on. The source of the data, of course, again, here I can drill down in which part of the EM approval package or FDA approval uh, package I want to go. And I will, for, 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 for this demo, uh, choose 
uh, endpoints extra extracted from phase three uh, that are primary endpoints and that are from uh, Let's start with that. And I will select also, uh, let's say, FDA uh, Medical Clinical Review. OK. I will hide this one. And here I've got, for, for instance, the first endpoint. Uh, that is uh, a study population is intended to treat. Uh, we have got all the value here. And I can go because the, finally the context is very important. Uh, 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 even if you have got a lot of details on, about the data, the context is very important. You can go directly to the page where the data is uh, extracted from. You can see that it's from there, it's this line. Uh, and you can scroll a little bit, having a look what is around the data. And it's, this table it, uh, is at the end of a part of the document where you have got the efficacy, efficacy summary and conclusion. So uh, there is in, in, in a few sentences what uh, is the results of this part of the study. And also an interesting uh, part here, how the secondary endpoints uh, support um, also uh, those conclusions. Uh, so this is, in a nutshell, this is how Pharmapendium, uh, using a unique taxonomy, uh, help you to quickly go uh, into the relevant data and, and provide you also the context uh, within uh, uh, the approval package. Uh, yes, that, that's, that, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jean-Dominique. Uh, thanks for this very nice uh, example. I think uh, you showed very nicely how with a few clicks we really can uncover a lot of critical efficacy data, which we then extracted from the full approval packages and helping you to select right endpoints, optimize experimental design, and, and, and uh, the, maybe also selecting, for example, right patient populations and, and, and patient sizes as well. So that was uh, very nice. Um, just to quickly round up, keeping an eye on the time here, let me just skip through this slide and, oh, it's a bit too animated. Basically, uh, hopefully what we have here as is, is, is a take-home message is that uh, Pharmapendium has a lot of unique, let's say, almost call it unique, but it's really hard to get regulatory content that's uh, document-based, that's not very easily to access. Um, often only available as, uh, as can microfiche files. From these documents, to really extract manually uh, use uh, with, uh, with PCMB level uh, scientists high quality data. Uh, today we talked about efficacy, but we also extract data around safety, uh, DMPK, and, um, and many other types of data. Then to make this data discoverable, we use a lot of expert taxonomy, including the indication taxonomy, and as well as the, uh, end, the in-house developed endpoint taxonomy we discussed uh, today. And we overlay this then with uh, uh, a user interface that allows easy retrieval and export data um, to further uh, process the data elsewhere where needed. And hopefully in conclusion, we can say that, um, that the summer pending helps to reduce the risk of unsuccessful clinical trials and reduce regulatory cycling by helping to improve clinical trial design, learn from past regulatory concerns, and consider different clinical strategies as well. Now, um, I think we're actually right on time. Um, I don't think there's any questions at this point, but if you think that this is interesting and um, you would like us to follow up with you, I'm just uh, pulling up the poll here. So if you think, yeah, well, 
please, uh, could you please uh, follow up with me on this? I find this interesting. I would like to know a bit more. You should be able to, underneath the viewing window, there should be now a poll where you can simply click on yes, and then uh, if everything works out, we got your details, and we can then easily follow up with you um, uh, on any questions or concerns or maybe uh, access interest you might be having. Um, and in the meantime, if you have any questions, also feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll get back to you on that as well. Now with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Also, jean Blick, thank you very much for your, uh, for your very useful contribution as well. Recording will be available and um, will be uh, distributed through the Bright Talk emails as well. And I believe the uh, slide deck is, will be included as well. Now with that, thank you very much for your attention and uh, hopefully see you on the next webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day.